Welcome back to another episode of Adeptus Talks with your host, Hubert Colvin, bringing you the brightest minds in cyber. Hello, welcome back to Adeptus Talks, your platform for cybersecurity insights from the professionals themselves. I'm your host, Hubert Colvin, and in today's episode, we're delving into a subject that's both fascinating and concerning, the security risks of generative AI. So generative AI has brought us remarkable advancements in various fields from art to music to natural language processing, but it has a dual nature. On one hand, it opens doors to endless possibilities, allowing us to generate content and solve complex problems like never before. But on the other hand, it raises critical questions about security, ethics and unforeseen consequences of AI creations. In this episode, we're going to unpack the security risks associated with generative AI, We'll explore how these AI systems, often referred to as creative machines, can be manipulated, misused, or exploited by manipulators. We fake videos that can deceive and manipulate to AI-generated phishing emails that prey on our trust. The world of generative AI presents a myriad of challenges. It's not all threats and risks. We're all going to explore some potential solutions and strategies to mitigate these risks, whether through ethical safeguards, ethical considerations, or even the regulatory landscape. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Daniel Byrne, Special Projects Manager at ProCheckup and Generative AI Security Aficionado. Dan, thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Adeptus Talks. Thank you, Hubert. Excited to be here. Good stuff. So start off, tell us how your journey so far has led you into the complex world of of generative AI and, and security. Yeah, absolutely. So from a young kid, I was always been interested in computers and creating websites and technology. Um, as I grew older, I kind of came more into the, the role of security, uh, statistics, information, security, and really the beginning of my career, I delved into the world of IT. So the, <laughs> the start of my career was selling uh, data infrastructure, um, things like storage, networking systems, and backup and recovery systems. Um, really, that led me into... Uh, a couple of really interesting startups that I worked in early on around artificial intelligence. So startups that were doing things like using artificial intelligence to hire the right person for a job based on their risk, uh, sorry, based on their personality traits, um, comparing that to the top performers within a role. Mm. Um, but I was always kind of brought back to my real love for IT and my interest in security. So that took me into a role that combined those two areas, which was artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Uh, one of the leading companies uh, in that space called Dark Trace, where I learned a huge amount uh, around not only just security, but really the, the risk landscape around security, as well as the huge potential for it to not only secure systems in a much faster and better way, but also really to improve how people work um, and really cut down on the manual repetitive Uh, and easily automatable tasks that, you know, typical security teams um, do have. Uh, That's, that experience really set me up well to kind of delve into this area. And more recently, I've joined uh, Pro Checkup, who are a cybersecurity firm traditionally focused on penetration testing, working out different ways to break into not just networks, web applications, um, but IoT devices, things like doorbells, things like aircon systems or even industrial control systems. Um, one of the areas that we've been researching for probably 15, 20 years now is artificial intelligence. And around about 2002, what the company did was built an artificial intelligence system, which was halfway between what we call a vulnerability scanner, which will assess you know, high level vulnerabilities in an application halfway between that and a full-blown person, a penetration tester who will use their manual expertise. Um, A really interesting tool, found lots of interesting vulnerabilities through it, um, lots of risk for security teams. And really what we've done now is we've taken that to the next level and we're looking to secure and assess the risks and defend against the risks in applications that are leveraging generative AI technology. Yeah, so that's it. It's it's funny because... Generative AI has kind of burst onto the scene in, in kind of the last 12, 18 months or so. But in reality, it has been around for an extremely long time and, and businesses have used it in different ways. And as you say, in some to help improve 
the security um, devices or technologies that we're using to to defend businesses. But it's only kind of recently from um, the, the launch of, of ChatGPT and, and other similar platforms that um, there has been a bit of a rush from organizations to adopt generative AI or large language models to, to be operating a lot of their, their standard business processes, um, either internally or, or client and, and customer facing as well. So the, the involvement that, that we've seen over such a short period of time has, has, has arguably led to a bit of neglect, perhaps, of, of what it might mean from a security landscape for these businesses. But from your experience, talk to us a little bit about some of the ways in which you're, you're potentially seeing businesses generative AI into their organizations yeah absolutely there's there's so many different ways really what I see with generative AI security as is the second wave of artificial intelligence the first wave probably came five maybe ten years ago if you really stretch it around predictive analytics so mm -hmm. using vast amounts of data to work out what's going to happen in the future or making a prediction for example in a previous company on a good candidate right the, the next wave is this generative AI security, um, generative AI technology, which really is leveraging, again, vast, vast amounts of data, um, but more so understanding of patterns between those pieces of data and using that to construct not only text, as you see in ChatGPT, but images, documents, music, speech, um, really creating that. Um, and... There's so many different use cases. <laughs> the typical ones really are chatbots. That's the one we're seeing is most widely adopted at the moment. Uh, chatbots that are trained on either company's data, um, their training uh, that support documents, perhaps previous conversations that support reps have had, and then applying that to the chatbot so it can answer questions that customers have. Um, I see that as the primary use case. There's so many more out there. And again, we're so early in this industry that we're going to see hundreds, if not thousands of more pop up. So there's there's so many different ways that, that it could be utilized. And, and for all the um the, the hype around the risks fit and so on and so forth, there's there's really an enormous an inherent amount of value that it can add to these businesses as well to to streamline and drive efficiencies into um, what are often considered administrational tasks in some organisations, but also repetitive tasks that that can, can be learned and can be done um, through through a generative AI tool or, or technology. So um, for organisations themselves. How, how are they going about incorporating them into their businesses? There's obviously got these different use cases, but is it the case that they're, they're building them from scratch? Are they looking to take technologies off the market to bring into their organizations? What, what do you see from the trends there? It's a combination of both, really. There's two main ways that this is going. Um, there's the closed source models, such as ChatGPT, um, Anthropic. A closed source model essentially is something that the company has owned it's a proprietary technology and as a user i can't delve into exactly how the model works it's a bit of a black box um, the other side of it is the open source models these are things like facebook uh, meta's uh, llama models where you can actually see the full code that's been written and i can download that and then run it on my local machine and have full control of that system there's pros and cons of both um, on the closed source side, these are more advanced models because, well, for a number of reasons, but a lot more investment has been put into them, um, as well as a huge amount of what we call reinforcement training, which is essentially where we have a team of people assessing whether the model is acting properly or not, and then using that information to then make it better. Uh, ChatGPT is a really good example of, <laughs> I suppose, having free users and leveraging the insights you have from those free users to build something really good. So it was a massive experiment really when the first chat GPT models came out for free. Um, what OpenAI have seen is a huge number of users, a huge number of uses, and all of that information that we've been feeding to those models has essentially been showing OpenAI what is good, what's bad, what are the potential risks. Um, so they can generate a huge amount of data and all of that data is basically making, making these models better and better and better. Where we're at right now is in terms of text to text, GPT-4 is 
the leader in this industry by quite a long way. And so for the complex tasks where we need extremely uh, well-written, well-thought-out and well-reasoned text, uh, the closed source models are winning, right? Um, on the more creative and personalized side where we're building applications that are, I suppose, they, they need more steering or, or more control for the developers, the open source models are winning. And ultimately, it's a race between these two sectors. Um, you'll see a lot of interesting stuff around litigation and, and legal um, legal sites where companies are trying to build moats around their systems and build regulations to stop companies from using or people from using open source models. But ultimately, it looks like the more open source models and the more use that these open source models get, the better open source will become. Yeah. And look, there's there's clearly use cases where where it shows that these technologies can be far more efficient than than humans that are that might have done the jobs previously and so on and so forth, allowing more accuracy in the way that we're either interpreting data or interpreting information and, and giving results that that could be hugely impactful to to either businesses or, or individuals as well. I think there are some use cases where where AI has been used in in medical screening. And, and has shown to identify more positive results or negative results than, than a human could do or a, do a qualified doctor could do itself um, at a far higher rate and higher pace. So there's clearly a lot of a lot of benefit that these, these technologies can bring. But obviously, from a security standpoint, I suppose the way that I see it, there's, there's kind of three areas to it. One is that businesses can use AI to help enhance their security within their business, machine learning tools, and so on and so forth. They can use AI in a way that's going to create a larger attack vector within the organization and, and, and potentially allow criminals in in different capacity. And also criminals can be using AI to drive more sophistication into the way that they're trying to attack businesses as well. So if we if we look at those kind of three things in isolation, there's a lot, a lot out there around the machine learning and technologies of how AI is being used to improve security. But where the use of, of generative AI is is newer, and we're seeing far more sophistication in in kind of ransomware or malware technologies or phishing emails and so on and so forth. Um, and the the attack vector that the generative AI, AI is creating within these businesses. How have you seen those influence or um, or, or play on the mind of, of systems within organisations? The, the, the new scary thing that they need to be thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a fascinating area, uh, security for these generative AI models, because it's so new. Um, we're seeing risks that we've never seen before in cybersecurity. Uh, a really good example of that is prompt injection. So essentially, as a person that's trying to attack these models or these systems that are integrated in generative AI technology, I don't need to know how to code anymore. I can literally write text. And I, call, I like to call it plain text hacking, where I'm not writing codes, not injecting uh, code into a system. I'm essentially slowly trying to manipulate and socially engineer the application instead of yeah, instead of actually just programming into it. Um, but really, the security risks they're 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 pretty vast. Um, the the issue so really on, is so that just coming back to that, what you're saying is basically that you're you're getting the generative AI to do what you want us to do just by asking it questions or telling it exactly. to do various things. Interesting. Yeah, spot on. And that going back to the benefits of this technology, that's that's really where it is, is that, you know, it's connected to vast amounts of data and any company that has, you know, hundreds, thousands more documents or, or you know, uh, reservoirs of text or, or whatever it is, instead of having a person scroll through all of that text and then, for example, a doctor having to read multiple books to diagnose a, um, an issue, AI does that pretty much instantly. It automatically finds the relevant parts of, of a book or the documents that it's attached to, and then it can pull that information out really quickly, which, um, as you hinted towards, is a lot more efficient and a lot more effective than a person can do. Um, but yeah, you're spot on. So essentially, instead of... This is where the, the industry is going, I think, with software development. We're moving away from very rigid databases where we have rows and rows of text and data is classified to a more semantic 
model where I can store data in a way that isn't necessarily so rigid, but knowing that I as a user or the users in my organization or my clients or my customers, all they have to do is just type a well-crafted question and they can find that data instantly. So it's a, a massive shift, I think, away from the traditional data infrastructure we have at the moment towards one that's a lot more free flowing and a more, lot more easy for the user to use. Yeah. So is that the inherent risk then that, that these generative AI technologies could be a route to that, um, that root data ultimately. And that root data is, is containing information that is considered either personal information or, or intellectual property of a, of a business, let's say, because it's that data that's been used to, to train the, the models, I suppose. So that is, is that the inherent risk then, that, that people can be getting access to that data when, when really a business is trying to protect it? Absolutely. That's the key risk at the moment. You think about you know large companies, companies of any size, really. Uh, a lot of them at the moment, data is their new oil, right? That's uh, come a very commonly spoken um, phrase, mm. but data, intellectual property, customer information, um, customer data, whether that's personally identifiable or not, that's so important to protect. And traditionally it's been locked away in very secure databases. And there's been lots of safeguards around that database to ensure that only the right people can access it, that it's always available and that it's kept uh, confidential um, when you start connecting ai systems into that data set for example with generative ai technology uh, you can think of that as uh, a mega user so a user that can make hundreds if not thousands of requests every second to try and understand and extract that data to then use in its reasoning and its output uh, the issue is <laughs> if uh, actually, an, another one, nice way to frame it is that if you view your company data as a treasure chest and you have security layers around that, your antivirus, your firewalls, your roles and privileges and permissions and so on, these are your moats and your guards and your, your cannons, you know, trying to yeah. defend uh, from external attackers. Uh, from a hacker's point of view, if I see or I know that a company has a Gentive AI application, that has all of this, these treasure chests, all of this data attached to it. And all I need to do is get access to that AI system. That's an absolute treasure trove for a hacker. If they manage to break into your network and get access to that Gentive AI application attached to all of your training data, it's pretty much game over. All they need to do is ask questions to that system to be able to extract all of that training data it's attached to. They don't need access to the database, purely the application that's attached to it. And do you think do you think businesses are aware of this as they as they drive the rush to incorporate this new technology to help enhance business processes or just to to keep up with the trend of, of emerging tech? Do you think they're really aware of, of the risk that it could be presenting to their business? I think so. The security teams are aware of it. But traditionally, well, at the moment, what we're seeing is that the generative AI applications are not built for the security teams, right? Uh, security is almost an afterthought. Uh, it's traditionally built by the marketing teams, the legal teams, um, the project managers who want to deliver really good products to their clients um, because the benefits of the technology are, you know, they're amazing. Um, and yes, they're trying to keep up with their competition who are shipping these applications as well. Yeah. Uh, what we're traditionally seeing is they're trying to get these applications out there to remain relevant and remain competitive. The security of it is becoming almost an afterthought. So they'll ship an application, then they'll send it across to the security team. Oh, can you please make sure that this is secure? Whereas what we really should be doing is, you know, being very wary of this technology, um, excited, but aware of the risks, the security risks, um, and actually baking in the security of that into the initial development of the applications and the systems. Yeah, and um, and I can imagine it is a, a nightmare for security teams that, that also haven't necessarily had to consider securing generative AI systems as well themselves. It must be a big learning curve for security teams to understand how to be building and baking security in, as you say, to these technologies and infrastructures there as they're being put together. So, um, 
what should companies be doing there? Talk to us a little bit about how, how you would advise organizations to consider security better um, or to the, the resilience of, of their generative AI technologies. Yeah, what you mentioned earlier is actually a really good point. So this generative AI security is bringing together two very highly technical uh, professions, the security side, which is, you know, extremely difficult, extremely complex. You have to spend years in the industry to even become you know, moderately good at it. Um, and on the other side, the data science or the artificial intelligence side of things, again, you know, you have to spend years and years researching, learning, uh, deploying models, testing and experimenting to actually become just, you know, moderately good. Um, traditional security teams are good at security, but they're not good at AI, vice versa. Traditional artificial intelligence teams are really good at AI, but they don't want to get involved with security because it hampers the progress of, of the mm. applications and the systems that they're building. So really for the larger organizations that have big security teams, what they should be doing is trying to integrate uh, the learnings and the knowledge between the two teams, the AI team, security team, trying to upskill some of their, uh, their team um, into artificial intelligence. So doing research on what are the risks, um, what are the regulations that are coming out, how do we actually begin understanding where this system is potentially vulnerable. Um, that's ultimately the first port of call for these large security, uh, large firms that are beginning to look into these applications. And then for the smaller teams that just can't afford or aren't able to do that or aren't able to resource these um I suppose, hybrid security and AI people who are very hard to come by. Uh, really, what they should be doing is looking out to specialist companies and specialist research arms that have been researching and understanding and trying to get their head around this, you know, this whole new risk landscape. Um, I suppose, ultimately, it comes down to proceed with caution, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, be excited by a technology, but um, be very aware that if you have a significant attack or breach on the system that's connected to important company data, it's not going to be good for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and what, what is the steps that a business can take to, to, to go ahead and do this from, from a testing point of view of, of a, a generative AI's resilience to so say, what what is there out there in the market to, to really get something secure or put it up to, to the bad actors first of all we look at the regulations um this is current and upcoming regulations we see them if you look at it from a worldwide perspective you see a new country uh, putting out a new regulation you know almost every month if not mm -hmm. more often than every month so in europe we have the eu ai act which has gained a lot of press um it's not been released yet but you know give it a few months and we'll probably have the first draft, if not an initial release for that regulation. Um, and then understand it, understand whether your company has to comply with it. Um, short answer, if you're building applications that integrate AI, then you will. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really step one, understand the regulatory and the compliance environment. Step two is look into a wider risk assessment for this type of technology. Uh, this is not just looking at the security side of things, it's looking at things like data privacy, um, it's looking at ethics, it's looking at biases in the models. Um, and if you take it even a step further, it's looking at the accuracy of the models. Um, essentially, is the model or the AI outputting the inf right type of information in line of the use case or the initial ideal use case with what we, we made it for? And then when you get down to more of an operational level, a more of a deeper dive into where are the risks, um, specifically security risks, then things like red teaming or penetration testing, um, where you hire you know, a team of experts that will go and try and break into the models and try and actually understand everything that can go wrong with it. That's, um, that's quite an important piece. Um, but a lot smaller than the, the wider risk assessment, for example. And just a, a small thing, um, traditional penetration testing is about finding vulnerabilities and it's about finding 
you know, specific areas where a hacker would break into. With artificial intelligence systems, especially specifically Gen AI, it's more about the wider risks. We don't want to just simply give you a hundred, a thousand vulnerabilities or ways that we saw the model went slightly wrong um, or outputted information that it probably shouldn't have. It's more about generalizing those risks and then trying to formulate defenses for each one of them. Yeah, got it. Really interesting. And um, and look, obviously there is a lot of research that's coming out about these, these new technologies and the risk and so on and so forth. But at the rate that things are evolving, that research is often quite quickly becoming outdated in of itself as well. So from, from your perspective, with um, with your crystal ball in front of you, what do you think the, the kind of the, the new future looks like with, with generative AI, te AI technologies? How, how widely adopted do you think they're going to be in these organizations? Gentive AI, I think five or 10 years, it'll be in every single organization, um, whether the users or even um, the employees know it or not. Uh, you look at the Googles, the Microsofts, IBMs, all of the large companies, um, they're building this and baking it into pretty much every system that we use. Um, Google has released you know, one of their systems recently, which integrates it across the whole Google suite. So I can talk to the AI, I can ask it to write emails for me, I can ask it to look through all of the documents that I have and extract relevant information. Uh, so it's going to be there. And whether the company calls it AI or not, uh, you know, people will be using it uh, in the same way that they use Google, but don't understand the actual names of the technology that power Google. Um, yeah. And just it reminds me of another point. Um, so where do I start looking at if I'm concerned about the security of these, uh, these technologies or these systems? The OASP top 10 for LLMs is a fantastic resource. So OWASP top 10 for LLM. Uh, that is essentially a crowdsourced effort from a number of researchers. I think it's you know, over, over a thousand researchers have um, put uh, their thoughts and their comments and their queries into this. Uh, and essentially it's a set of top 10 risks that are present with large language model systems. So highly recommend anyone interested to go and have a look at that research. Brilliant. That's really good. Well, um, well, thank you, Dan. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you about this topic. As we've seen, generative AI is, is an awe-inspiring technology, but it, it does come with its own set of challenges and vulnerabilities. The world of cybersecurity is, is evolving alongside these advancements as we strive to, to kind of safeguard our digital landscape and emerging threats. Um, we hope you found our exploration into cyber risks of, of generative AI both enlightening and, and thought provoking. Um, if you'd like to reach out to Dan to find more about find out more about what his he and his team are doing at ProCheckup, um, then you'll find him on LinkedIn under Daniel Byrne. That's B Y R N E. Um, or please go to the ProCheckup website to, to look at some of the services and solutions that they offer. Um, there is also a LinkedIn newsletter that ProCheckup put out called Generative AI. Um, security updates by pro checkup so please subscribe to that and, uh, and get some upcoming content around uh, the the threats that that we're facing from these technologies and um, lastly don't forget to subscribe to adeptus talks your platform for cybersecurity insights from the professionals themselves thank you dan thank you hubert thank you for joining us for another episode of adeptus talks be sure to subscribe and you can listen to us wherever you find your podcasts we look forward to bringing you another insightful conversation with an industry expert very soon.